All right, we're going to get back into this. If you're new here, we're gonna, uh, we've been doing a growth series for the last six weeks. We're on week five of six. So if you're tired of hearing about spiritual growth next week, you'll be happy. Because it'll be the last time <laughs> I talk about it for a while. And then we're going to start a new series. I was thinking about what series to start. And we're probably going to start a series called How to Neighbor. Um, just because I think we need that right now in the world that we're living in. So um, we're probably going to start a series called How to Neighbor. But as far as this series, if, if, if you don't notice, uh, you can actually see my tomato plant this week, right? We planted that. I went to Lowe's and did not get. That's the actual one that I planted. I did confess that if it didn't grow, I was going to go to Lowe's and got, get one. But that is the real one, I promise. Um, no, but it really is the real one. <laughs> So that's how much a tomato plant will grow in five weeks. If you water it and nurture it and give it sunlight, all the things that it needs to grow. And we, we planted that as a reminder of us growing. You know, we can't just do the same thing and not get any water, not get any sun's light in our life and expect to grow. But if we have plenty of water and food and sun's light, then we can expect to see some growth. So this week we're talking about growing pains. Now, I use the word pains because some of this is going to hurt. And just like growing, it hurts. We're going to study the same passage of scriptures for the next two weeks. We're going to be out of Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 for the next two weeks. We're going to look at the pains this week, and then we're going to look at the pluses next week. So this week we're going to look at what hurts. And then next week, we're going to look at what we get out of what hurts because no pain, no gain. Right? So <laughs> let's turn, to, uh, let's turn your, your Bibles to Ephesians 4, starting at 17. Now, we remember from last week, Ephesians was written by Paul, probably in AD 60-ish. He was probably in Rome at the time when he wrote this. Um, he wrote this to the church that he started a church that he spent three years with. So this was like his family. This was like his friends. This was like people he hung out with. This wasn't just a, you know, acquaintance situation. This were, these were his friends. And the main reason for him writing the letter to uh, Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus, was to encourage them, to, to lift them up, to, to encourage them to grow, to encourage them to, to, to get strong in their faith. So... Keep that as the backdrop as we study this because it makes sense when you read it, when you understand the context it was written. Um, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over into sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Doesn't sound too much different than today's culture, does it? That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ, you were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard of your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then it goes to therefore. And we're going to stop there because we're going to get to the rest of that in a minute. There's some more we want to learn. So, when we grow in life, there's a lot of milestones that we look forward to. There's so a lot of happy things. There's a lot of good things. Like parents take pictures of the first tooth. 
and the first steps and the first diaper. No. Anybody got pictures of the first diaper? Why not? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of great things, a lot of good things. First words. Does anybody remember the first words their child spoke to them? A lot of first. Mine, of course, both of my kids was daddy. Of course it was. That's how I remember it. I don't care what they say. No. There's a lot of great things when you're growing. A lot of good things, milestones. But there's also some things that when you're growing that are painful and hurt. Um, like responsibilities. <laughs> Those hurt. Anybody remember their first bill that they had to pay on a monthly basis when they were a teenager or a young adult? What about your first job? That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? What about for some of us, do you remember your first gray hair? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, how about the first time you woke up in the morning and went, oh, I'm not 20 anymore. <laughs> There's some pain that happens as you age, as, as you change. But some of those pains have to happen, right? There's things called growing pains. As your muscles grow and stretch, there's some, some hurt that happens. So as we're looking at those pains, still we must grow. And with responsibility comes the freedom, right? How many can, how many can remember you're 16, 15 or 16, and the only thing you can think about is, man, if I could just get out of this house. My parents are so crazy, and they don't know what they're talking about. And they don't have any idea. How many of you remember that moment? And how many of you remember when you were 25 and you said, my parents were so smart, I hate them. <laughs> and you had to admit to yourself that they were trying to teach you something that you wouldn't listen to? I remember, I remember it was like yesterday. Um, I'm putting my daughter, who was at the time like two years old, to bed in her, her toddler bed. And I'm laying there reading her a book. And at some point in time, it just hit me that I'm responsible for this child. And it was like a weight, boom, hit me. And I'm, I called my mom, sorry, mom, for everything I ever did. You've ever had, have you ever had that moment? I didn't know what I was doing. I see now what you were trying to tell me. Those moments, growing pains. That's what we're talking about. Sometimes there's some pain, but what you learn from the pain helps you. What's the hardest thing about growing? Anybody know the answer to this one? Without putting it up, don't, don't cheat yet, Ken. What hurts the most? <laughs> Admitting you're wrong. That's one. Adju I like the second word. What was that? Change. Change hurts. Change really hurts. Change is the root for having to admit you're wrong. Change is those things that everybody's scared of. Especially as you're getting out into the world, as you're growing up. So what are the things that we're talking about in Ephesians that has to change? If you look back, verse 17 and 24. I mean, verse 17 through 24, Paul is talking to them and he says, So I tell you and insist on in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. You have to change, is what he's saying. You can't live in the futility of your mind anymore. Being darkened. They don't understand. They're separated from God. Now, what were the, who were the Gentiles? Anybody know? When the word Gentiles mentioned in the Bible, it was anybody that was not a Jewish. So, Paul was saying, anybody that does not live as God wants you to live, you can't live like that anymore. In the futility of your thinking, in the darkened of your mind, they're separated. And what does that separation lead to? It leads to the hardening of the heart. It leads to losing all sensitivity. Um, I have a hard time a lot of times looking at some of these. I've never, I've never been a scary movie person. 
Now, if you're a scary movie person, then more power too. But I've never been a scary movie person because I don't think, I don't see how you could look at that and, and not feel, ugh. How could somebody want to watch that? But when you've lost all sensitivity, two things. It's a, it's a sign of our culture. We've lost the sensitivity. We see, we see you know, shootings and we see bodies on TV and we, we see all this stuff and we've been desensitized to it. And we don't even see it as bad anymore because we've seen it so much. But Paul says you have to change your thinking first. Um, one of the things that he, he, he mentioned was lust. They're all caught up in all kinds of sensuality and indulgent in sensuality. He's talking about lust and he's talking about greed. But it all starts in the mind. There's no sin that you've ever committed that you didn't, didn't start up here first. There's no person that's ever committed adultery that it didn't start with an emotional relationship first. There's no sin that you will commit if you can get this under control first. Paul says you have to change your thinking. Then the next thing he's talking about change is your actions. Verse 25 through 28, we're going to continue reading here. Um, we stopped at God created us to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. And then it said, therefore. And anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, you have to ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? Anybody ever heard that? So he says, first you've got to change your thinking. And then 28, no, 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. We talked about that last week. In our anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. So first thing God's calling us to do for change, change our thinking. We got to think about what we're thinking about. If there's some stuff that you're thinking about that you know God does not want for you in your life and that you know is against His Word, then that's where you need to pray. That's where you need to change. That's where you maybe need to seek counsel. There's some things going on in my brain I need somebody to talk to before it becomes something else. The next thing God, Paul tells us to do is we have to change our actions. He says, stop lying. That one's easy, right? How many in here, let's try this one. How many in here ever lied before? If you're not raising your hand, you're lying now, so you might as well raise your hand. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> it's not even, it's the little ones that's the hard one, right? Thank you. But it's the ones that you think are, are for somebody else's benefit, right? We can justify to ourselves. Uh... I don't have to tell them that. Paul says, stop lying. Speak the truth to your neighbor. And he also says, stop being controlled by anger. This whole uh, sentence about do not, uh, do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the sun go down on, while you're still angry. And, you know, there's a lot of people that will that'll preach a sermon about you have to speak to somebody real quick before you go to sleep and figure this out. Sometimes that's not possible. But what the point Paul is making here is that your anger should not control you. You should control it. That if, if I don't control the anger, what am I doing? I'm giving the devil a foothold into my life. 
Because what can he do? He can get in that ear over there and, eh, yeah, can you believe what they did to you? That's right. Are you going to take that? Well, Paul says, stop lying. Stop being controlled by your anger. That's how we grow. And stop stealing. Is that one easy to do? Stop stealing? Anybody in here ever stole anything? I want to hear those stories where you were a kid and you stole something and your mom made you take it back to the store. And You ever have one of those moments? I had, I had one of those moments with, when I was a teenager. I didn't actually steal, but I was with somebody that stole. And it scared me to death because the, the guy that is in charge of uh, loss prevention like grabbed us in the hallway and took us back to the room. And they gave us the whole speech. And the cops came. And our, our parents had to come pick us up. Whoa. That, that broke me. But what about, you know, cheating on your taxes? Is that okay? Is it okay to, to, to just smidge a little bit? You know, nobody really knows. Tax people, they get all the money anyway. What about, you know, overbidding the job a little bit, just to get a little extra? What about, you know, turning in a few more receipts to the company that really weren't business receipts? Is that stealing? When God says don't do it, it's don't do it. If we're going to grow, these things hurt. We've got to stop being, stop. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change the way we act. And here's the next one Paul gets to. We're going to go on down to verse 29. We've got to change our tongue. And this one's real easy, I know, because um, none of us have problems with this. <laughs> verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful to building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. No unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. We talked about it last week that our job as Christians, together as one body, is to build up each other. And to build up others and to bring in others and teach and, and disciple and, and send out. And there's like this whole circle of life scenario where, where we, we bring them in, we teach them and disciple them, we send them out to bring them in to teach them and disciple them. That, that's, the, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But if we're talking bad about the people we're supposed to be building up, then we're not doing what God's called us to do. And here's the, here's the tear. Don't lie, but don't have unwholesome talk. Only what is good about building up. This is where the term your mama always said was, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. You ever heard that one? That's where that comes from. Don't get yourself into trouble here. But there is a way to say stuff to people that they need to hear without being controlled by anger without lying to them, and without letting the unwholesome stuff come out of your mouth like the, um, I won't use any examples. You all know the examples. You've probably heard them. <laughs> so, we have to change our thinking, change our actions, change our tongue. Um, and here's the next one. Change your temple. Paul is talking about our body as a temple. If you go down to verse 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. It says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, Christ God forgave you. So, we're changing our thinking. We're thinking about what we're thinking about. We're changing our actions. We're thinking about what we're doing. We're changing our tongues. We're thinking about what we're saying. And we're changing our temples. We're thinking about 
who we're serving. These are the marks of a mature Christian. These are the things that sometimes hurt, but they have value and they will bring, we'll find out next week all the good things that come out of changing these things. But the Holy Spirit is supposed to live in us as individuals, but also collectively. And if we grieve that Holy Spirit, if we do the things that we know He doesn't want us to do, it's sort of like if you're a parent and you've taught your, your children, and even when they're young and you've, you've taught them not to do a certain thing because you just know, and then they do it anyway. You don't not love the child anymore, but your heart hurts, right? Your heart hurts because you see the path they're going down. And I think about this a lot because my parents had to have a lot of prayers and a lot of hurt hearts for a lot of years over me because they saw the path I was going down. And God, if God hadn't spoke to me on the side of that road when the cops had me in handcuffs and changed my heart and changed my thinking and changed my temple, I could imagine the pain and the anguish that my parents would have went through. And as a parent, you know, when you're a kid, you don't realize, you don't think about that. But when you become a parent and you experience some of that heart hurt that you've caused your parents, it changes the way you think. And so when, when I read this passage, I don't think about a, a, a God standing up there with a billy club wanting to smack people in the head. I think about a, a God up there in tears going, I'm trying to show you the things you're doing is, go, is taking you down the wrong path. You're going to end up hurt. You're going to end up lost. So Paul says, don't grieve that Holy Spirit that lives in you. Don't make His heart hurt. But follow that Spirit. I used this example before many times, um, especially when we're talking about kids and we're talking about growth. Is, I think it works well. But we think about a playground. You know, if we have a playground out here in the front yard for our kids, and it's like God gives us, you know, this world as our playground. But if we put that playground out there and we don't build a fence around it, how many of you are going to let your two-year-olds go out by the road in the front yard and play on the playground if there's no fence and stay in here and not watch them? God's rules and God's plans and God's purpose for our life is like the fence around the playground. He wants you to have fun. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to live to the fullest of your potential. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to love. He wants you to experience life. He wants you to grow. But he puts a fence around the playground because he doesn't want you in the road. And he doesn't want you to get hurt or hit by the car. And so if we're following God's teaching and his word, it's like staying inside the fence. And he's trying to keep us safe. And he's trying to keep us to a place where he can grow us past the playground that we don't need fences anymore. And then we know to not touch the stove and not play in the street when the cars are coming. And, and, and we've learned and we've grown into the person that knows when it's okay to cross the street to get the ball. Is this analogy making any sense here? That's what spiritual growth is about. We got to think about what we're thinking about. We got to think about what we're doing. We got to think about what we're saying. You know, words are big. You can tear somebody down with some words in, in just a minute. And we got to think about who we're serving. That's what spiritual growth is. And some of this is going to hurt. Because you're going to be at work and it's going to be easier to say, 
man, I need to make that extra $100. But you're going to have to say to yourself, that's stealing. Or you're going to be at work and you're going to want to talk bad about that person that, that you just want to talk bad about because they deserve it. I got some gills. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Y'all got some people, right? But God's Spirit does not want that. Because why? He's trying to use you to show somebody the difference. He's trying to use you to bring somebody else into his family. He's trying to use you as a part of his body to touch, to reach, to teach. So the last question of the day is, what change is the hardest for you? What is it for you? Is it the thinking? Is it the actions? Is it the tongue? Is it the temple? And I'll, I'll show, we're going to talk about this next week because these all line into the way we learn and the way we react. It starts in the brain, moves to the hands, and to the actions, to the tongue. Once we get this under control, it starts to move to the other places. But it's the brain and the spirit that matters. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word and that you're teaching us to be more like you. You're teaching us that we need to grow and that we need to um, change our actions, that we need to change the things that we say, that we need to change the things that we do that grieve your spirit. Lord, we, we pray for direction this morning. We pray for your spirit to be upon us in our decision-making process, your spirit to be upon us in our thinking and our, our actions in our daily lives that we will think about the fact that you're in us and you're trying to live your life through us and that we will give you control of this temple and control of this mind and control of these hands. Now, everybody with their heads bowed, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you to come front. But if there's something, one of these things that touched a, a, a nerve with you this morning that God's using in your heart, that he, you know he's trying to make a change in your life. You can slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. You know that there's something he's wanting to do. I see all of your hands. That's awesome. God's working in us all. So we're going to pray right now. Father, you see each hand and you know each mind. And we thank you that you're using your spirit to change us. We want to grow. We want to be like you. We ask that you would help us, even though it hurts, to do the things that you're calling us to do. Help us to be your body. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.